Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce you to Kevin Ryan. Kevin is in the class of 85. Um, for some of you that, that may sound old, but Kevin, don't worry, because I'm in the class of 77. Um, Kevin is one of the leading internet entrepreneurs. He helped build DoubleClick. How many of you have heard of DoubleClick? Okay. And he founded and is chairman of a long list of companies, and I'll just read them. MongoDB, who's heard of MongoDB? Workframe, a Nomad Health, and he uh, also had found, founded and was the chairman of Business Insider and Guild. Um, to me, though, despite all of these wonderful things he has done, what I think is so terrific is he sits on the Yale Corporation and spends countless hours working to advance Yale's interests. And I'm so grateful to him, not just for being here today, but for all he has done for Yale. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. I don't need it, do I? Good. Okay. Great. Well, thank you uh, for that introduction. And uh, I am excited to be here because the two things I probably spend the most time on are entrepreneurial activities and Yale, and this sort of brings it all together. So it's a perfect fit. Um, we just finished the corporation meeting. Uh, it is a big commitment. It's an incredible institution. Uh, you know, so we were here Thursday uh, from 3 o'clock through dinner. Yesterday we had meetings from 8, eight in the morning till through dinner at 9 last night. And this morning from 8 in the morning till 1 o'clock we just finished. And that's, that's a board meeting. Uh, and we have four or five board meetings a year. Uh, so it's a big commitment, but it's also an enormous institution with a lot of things going on, countless numbers of schools. Once you get into it, you realize that there's a whole parts of Yale that you probably didn't know about because you're either an undergraduate or you're in the forestry school or you're in the med school. Um, you know, we went to tour the Wright Laboratory yesterday, which I had never seen uh, and is, uh, is quite extraordinary. So anyway, that, that part's been uh, great. And we can, I can answer any questions later on about that. But what I wanted to talk about mostly was just what you're thinking about. You're thinking about uh, working somewhere in the new economy, let's say. And uh, first of all, that's the right decision. You're in the right room. Uh, everyone should be here. It is the most fun. Uh, you know, it's extraordinary for me to think that when I arrived at Yale, which does sound to you guys like 50 billion years ago, but to me it doesn't feel like it was that long ago, but you know, no one even had a computer. I mean, no one on my floor had a computer. I bet some of you have a computer. Uh, and so, it's, so just in a short period of time, though, you know, my entire career has been defined, and I'm known for spending 20 years working in the internet, which didn't exist as a name or an industry even as I was graduating from Yale. So there was there was the beginnings of the internet that existed out there, but not a single person in normal life knew about it. Uh, so if I said to you, uh, I think you know, when you're sitting here in 30 years speaking, you'll be known for having you know, devoted your life to this industry, and it actually hasn't been created yet. And you're like, how do I prepare for that? That's a little challenging. Uh, and so you, that, that's to remind you, you don't know how things are gonna play out. I mean, I very hard to predict, obviously. So, but what we are seeing, and I think everyone here knows this, is just a radical transformation of just every part of society, of education, of uh, commerce, and technology is playing a role. And so that was why this industry is so much fun, because everything is shifting and changing. And sometimes it just gets categorically replaced. You know, when I was in high school, there were no ATMs. And so that came in and, you know, 35 years ago and just replaced and, and tellers mostly went away and it became more efficient. You can pull out money all the time. Uh, so we've seen full transformation there. Other areas, you're just seeing the value being extricated out of industries. So. You know, Priceline, the, the most valuable internet company on the East Coast, so probably $60, $80 billion in value in Connecticut. So that, you know, it, they don't own any assets, and yet I believe recently were more valuable than all the airlines put together. Uh, so, and all they do is help you find the right ticket, and then airline companies have to provide, you know, buy $200 billion worth of planes, and they'll fly them, and then for the last 40 years, up until the last five years, never make any money on that. And, and, and this, all that value was extricated out of the industry by basically an internet player. And so that is an example of what you're going to see uh, across the board, across the board. So in some places it's categorically happened and you're using it every single day and know these products. And in others, in B2B, it's happening in a more subtle way that you, you wouldn't see yet unless you're in that industry. So let me give you different examples of things that I've been involved with. So 
Dublik was a great run, nine years from 15 people. Imagine this, I'm 30, 32, so I become the president of DoubleClick. Uh, four years later, we have 2,000 employees in 25 countries. So that's a lot of stuff that has to happen. We go public uh, 24 months after the company was started. Can't even do that anymore, uh, but it was super fun. Uh, and so great, great company, you know, worth $12 billion four years after we started it. Feeling pretty good. It wasn't really worth $12 billion, but it was publicly traded. It was worth $12 billion. Then you get to the downside where the stock price goes from $130 to $5 a share. 70% of our clients go bankrupt. That's much, much less fun. Uh, seven rounds of layoffs. So when you go into being an entrepreneur, there are some amazing moments and times that are fantastic. And there's some times that are just, let's call them less than amazing. Uh, and when you're doing round after round of layoffs to try and make sure you can save the company. So the final conclusion was that it wiped out 70% of our clients, but 80% of our competitors. So we picked up about 30, 35% of our original revenues from them. So we net lost 35%. We got rid of 50% 50 of our employees, ended up with 60% of the world's market in ad technology and 35% uh, profit margins, eventually sold to, uh, to Google for $3 billion in 2007. And today, if we're independent, we're probably worth $10 billion. It's a huge part of the internet infrastructure. So great first experience for me. I then, since then, have started a bunch of different companies. I have no focus whatsoever. I only think of problems that are out there. What needs to be solved? What, and this is what you need to be thinking about if you're starting a company, which I don't think is the only thing that people should be doing at, at 20, but uh, at some point in your life you should. And you're always thinking of what is more expensive, what is harder, what is, what is complicated to do, what takes too long. And if you find something like that, your average person just says, well, I guess that's just how it is. And, but an entrepreneur says, wait a second, maybe I can solve that. And I'll work on that. So I'll give you multiple examples there. So uh, so we started uh, MongoDB, a deeply technical company. It actually uh, it, it was announced a couple weeks ago that we're going public right now. And so in the next several weeks, uh, companies on the roadshow now uh, might be priced, if all goes well, uh, in probably two weeks. Uh, last round was worth about $1.4 billion. Deeply technical database. Uh, very hard company for us to get off the ground. So right now it was like, oh my God, a huge success. Yeah, yeah, you weren't there in the beginning. When even though the two of us who had been, you know, really worked at DoubleClick and were founders and uh, had sold this company for billions, and you think, okay, you can raise money. But we had this idea, uh, ultimately for a database that was a different type of database, technically, was a different type of business model. It's open source. People didn't have successful open source where companies where you gave away your database. We had the worst business model you could possibly imagine, which is, I go to you and say, look, would you give us millions of dollars? Here's what, how it's gonna work. For two years, we're gonna have to uh, work on building the product, because it's an incredibly complicated product. Then for two years, we're gonna give it away. And so after four years, we'll have no revenue, but, but that's not, I'm getting to the best part. The best part also is that none of us have any database background whatsoever. There are three co-founders. The other two technical, me not technical. Um, so we don't have any relevant experience really. We've done ad technology, which is not at all the same thing. Uh, and, and at that point, you know, we'll start to grow it and it'll be great. And so everyone's like, business risk, technology risk, team risk, um, they just all passed. And so really hard to get money. We scraped through, got enough money to keep going slower than we thought. And then now, now everyone wants to give us money uh, because we don't need money anymore. And that's when everyone wants to give it to you. Uh, so, but we got to the right place, which is uh, a, a good outcome. Started, uh, I want to do a comparison because one month, in May 2007, I actually had ideas for two companies at the same time. And normally I don't like to do two at the same time, but I just really liked both ideas. One was guilt and one was business insider. And so, but if we checked in two years after I started both those companies simultaneously, guilt was doing $175 million in revenue, which is crazy two years later. So it was just a phenomenon. And business insider was doing uh, almost the same thing as long as you divide it by 100. It was doing 1.75 million in revenue. So if you had asked me, or if I had asked you at the time, which company do you think is be more valuable? And you'd been, look, are you, I'm not an idiot, obviously guilt. And so fast forward seven years later, I actually sold them both coincidentally within about three months and sold Business Insider for $450 million and sold guilt for $250 million. 
uh, because we could never really get guilt to make money. The business model was always hard. It was an incredible product. It's 600 million in revenue. By the way, 600 million in revenue for Gilt and Business Insight at the time was doing 45 million in revenue and sold for more money. And so one of the other conclusions is that you just don't know how the business model is going to play out over time. There's just a lot of uncertainty. So if someone says to you, you're starting a company and like, you know, you're not going to do it because you don't know this, you don't know this. I never know anything when you start a company. I mean, you have an instinct that something can be there, but there's going to be things that play out that you just cannot forecast. And so all you can do is say, look, I'm going after a good idea. I think there's a big enough market. I'm going to hire great people and have great execution. And I'm going to learn along the way and have to adjust some things. So sometimes you start something and it goes in a direction that you just didn't forecast. And you've got to be smart enough to strike the middle ground of not abandoning something right away, but abandoning it if it's really not working. And the question always is, how do you know that? And that's a judgment call. I mean, it's actually no different than if a friend of yours came to you and said, look, do I break it with my girlfriend? I don't know if it's working out. Do you, what's the right answer? I mean, the answer is kind of depends. I mean, I have to see the situation, no, and you never quite know. And so this is a judgment call. It's never easy. But good outcomes on both. I started a company called Zola uh, probably four, yeah, four years ago, which is a wedding registry. And here's another different lesson. So obviously there are a gazillion wedding registries. Bloomingdale's Target, Crate and Barrel, Bed Bath & Beyond, Williams Sonoma, you know, Amazon, and then uh, a couple startups. So you might have said, as a lot of people did, why would you possibly do that? But it turned out I could see that they weren't doing what you should be doing. If you register to Bloomingdale's uh, to get married, they only sell you the products that Bloomingdale's has. And that's a classic mistake of not thinking of my customer. So if you interviewed 50 uh, grooms and brides, although brides uh, statistically drive a lot of the decision making, um, they would say, look, what I wanted on my registry was some things from you know, uh, a blender and plates and a couple things like that. But I really also wanted yoga classes because we're really into yoga and I wanted help, help on my honeymoon and I really wanted uh, cooking classes and a wine bottle and a tent because we're really into camping and Bloomingdale's doesn't have any of those things and so I need to jerry-rig maybe three other registries and complicated. So the obvious solution was just have the ability to put everything in one place and do it really well. Next year we'll do $280 million in wedding gifts. It's enormously large, already bigger than Bloomingdale's in the uh, wedding space. And is, we've launched since then uh, wedding websites. So when you get married now, you often have your own website that's a core base where you can, all your guests can see where the hotels are, they can see who's coming, you can plan the whole tool. 100,000 couples in the first 12 months will use it. Uh, we're giving away for free because, of course, when you use that, you often use the registry and we'll make $600 off that. So that's going to be uh, a billion dollar company. Um, in, the, in the wedding space. There's a big, big opportunity. No one's done a good job there in a space that people thought was just crowded and not there. So it's really, at the end of the day, when you're thinking of these new business models though, you, it sounds like a cliche, but you need to understand the customer. I don't ever put a financial model together in the, when I'm making a decision. Now that, if you go to the business school, they'll tell you you've got to have a financial model. Uh, I was a CFO. I have a CFA. I actually have a deeply financial background. So it's not that I can't do a financial model. It's that you financial model won't work. What I want to know is, is there a product opening? Do I have a vision for a product that is going to be distinctive from what is out there? And if I can do that, most of it will follow. So it's just like if you're going to start a, a Japanese restaurant, you would, everyone knows Japanese restaurants can make money. You can put a model together and it'll show that it makes money. There's only one thing that matters is in a restaurant. Is it full? And so you need to get to the core issue of what's going to make your restaurant full. Because if it's full, everything will work. And if it's empty, it doesn't matter how much you paid for the paper and the plates and all that stuff. It just won't matter. So make sure you're focusing on that core, core, core decision. And it's generally around product. So uh, a lot of things I'm seeing now and things I think you should be thinking about are more in the business to business category. Um, a lot of consumer ideas are, are somewhat solved. So if I asked you right now, you know, jeans you're wearing, can you get those online? Can you get a hotel room? Can you find a date? Can you go get a ticket? I mean, name 20 things. And the answer is in like three minutes, I can go on my phone and solve every one of those problems. So not as many opportunities. Uh, there's a, a problem that most people don't think about here, which is hospitals hiring temporary doctors. So actually there's $15 billion a year and many hospitals, especially in rural areas, have huge problems because they just don't have a spinal surgeon for the next three months because one's on maternity leave 
or they're in a ski resort. How does a ski resort, if you ran a, a hospital in Aspen, how do you handle five times more patients, staffing-wise, during February than you did in November? And so you're like, oh, I actually need temp doctors for that three-month period, just like I need temp ski instructors. So it's actually a huge thing. Every hospital uses them. And up until now, they had to do this by hiring a search firm. So imagine the search firm. If I said to you, can you find me a doctor who's a spinal surgeon who wants to go to Albany, New York, February 1st? You'd be like, I have to make a lot of phone calls to do that. That is a super inefficient process. As a result, if he's going for three months, you'll charge me $50,000 fee just to find the person, someone who's going to be with me for three months and go away. So the conclusion should be, that just feels expensive. That feels too much. That doesn't feel right. What is the right solution? The right solution is a database. What if I had, which is what I do have now, 11,000 doctors in there who are all only there because they're available for temporary work. And they put their dates in there and they put their criteria. So now I can just go, you know, uh, Albany, New York, spinal surgeon, February 1st, and maybe 12 show up. I interview those 12, I pick one, boom, I'm done. And we charge them half as much because we don't have to go make all the phone calls. So that is going to be a very successful business. It's only two years old. Uh, in January, we only had 800 doctors on the platform. Now we have 11,000. And we were able to, this is a two-sided marketplace, right? And we, had to, we crossed the valley of death. When you start a marketplace, imagine a dating site. Imagine a, a male-female dating site. Um, if you start off and have 100 guys and 100 girls on the site, it doesn't work. It just fundamentally doesn't work. You go on there, I'm like, oh, I want someone who speaks French and likes classical music, and there are none. And so you just abandon and you go, because it only starts to work once you have 10,000 people on it or something. And so we had that problem, and you got to push right through it very quickly before people figure out that your product doesn't work and get there. And now I think we're pretty much there. So that's where you Another company. So I've moved uh, offices 15 times. And as, as CEO, I've, you're, you're responsible for it. You're not doing all the work, but you're making a lot of decisions. And in every single room, including this room, someone had to make a decision. There was literally like 200 decisions in this room. Someone chose this, someone chose that, someone chose this. I mean, there's all kinds of decisions. And so there's actually no technology tool that allows you to do that correctly. So what we did is create that tool uh, so I can see on a drawing this place. I can see all the furniture and where it's going to go. I have a, I, we put a product catalog in there. So the interior decorator, who's not even in the room, can pick out 10 chairs, 10 of these chairs, versions, put them on there. Then I can say, no, no, I want this one or that one. I can see the price. The CFO can then, you can automatically see how the budget is because our budget was, let's say, $25,000 for this room. But if I start making some decisions that go above that, that's a pain. So you can see that in real time. Then the head of facilities can sign off. I can see all the comments right there. If you guys have used Slack ever, it's sort of a version of that. And this process just goes so much faster, so it can cut the time down and the accountability down. So we provide that. And with that tool, we also help you if you need an architect, project managers. They're not on our payroll, but we have a network. Long story short, we started this about a year ago. And last quarter, we signed $10 million worth of construction projects. We're building 20 offices, four squares office. We built Zola's office. Uh, we have a lot of offices that we're building right now for this or that they're using the tool. So, and I'm gonna roll out to 30 cities over the next couple of years and solve a problem that you guys haven't dealt with. But if at Mongo, when we open an office in Dublin and we have 20 salespeople, 25 salespeople, we need to build out an office. But we don't have a facilities person because it's not a big enough office to have a full-time facilities person. So who does that? Like you can take one of your sales guys and say, why don't you do it? He doesn't have any idea how to do this, and he's not going to do it well. So I'll have a team there. We can just call up, Mongo, call up Workframe and do it for us. So just these are other random types of businesses in a way, but are solving a problem that I have run across. Okay, I'll tell you one. I'm, oops, sorry, that I'm doing right now. You're really going to think it's crazy. Uh, but I, am, I want to build a competitor to Starbucks. See, I thought you'd be good. Fully automated. So here's the, here's the question. Right now you go in and you pay $4.50 in Manhattan and you get a cup of coffee that no one thinks is like the best cup of coffee in the whole world. And you wait eight minutes uh, in the full cycle to get that. So the question is, do you just say that it could never be done better? By the way, the cost of the cup and the coffee, the ingredients, is 40 cents. So I look at that and I think, I think I can do better. And I also know, point number two, that there is a... Um, a machine, you can get a machine, if you want to spend $5,000 for a machine in your house, 
a super, super nice machine, everyone says it makes great coffee. So we know machines can make great coffee, but yet that's not happening. So where I'd like to be a year from now is have created a machine that you can walk in here and, and say, uh, look, here, iPad's here, you can make your order or just on your phone, no cash, no people collecting, you just put it up there. See on the screen, Kevin's the second one. Two minutes later, because I'll have five machines, so I'll have five times the throughput of a Starbucks. So the, ideally, there'll be no lines at all. And we'll have tested a thousand different versions of how to make every version of coffee with a coffee sommelier. And so whether it's 16 seconds or 18 seconds or 21 seconds, it should be boiled at the right temperature. By the way, if you drink tea, for example, you go to Starbucks and green tea is served at the same temperature as black tea. No one in the whole world who knows anything about tea does that because green tea gets too bitter, um, but they just can't adapt to that. So it's actually not as good a product as it should be. So obviously these things always look good on paper. Uh, right now I'm feeling good about it and I haven't done anything yet. I'm actually out interviewing mechanical engineers and robotics people right now. So I'm gonna build a team and then over the next, ideally six months from now or six months from the, when the person starts, I will have a prototype of a machine that I can test. If that works, I then have multiple choices. I can go do this in a uh, Kevin's Coffee, not that name, but uh, <laughs> something else and then uh, start a branded uh, system or I could sell that machine to the uh, Yale Dining Hall or every hospital that has a problem in the middle of the night, they need to serve coffee and it's either bad coffee, everyone complains about it, or it could be in the back of a uh, truck or I was at the US Open where there's a 25 minute wait. So just think, if you see a 25 minute wait, you're like really, this just, just can't be solved. There's no way that in 2017 where we're practically putting people on Mars that we can get, you know, that I, like if I go to, I'm going to Yankees game tomorrow and you have to decide which inning you're going to miss when you go get food. Is that necessary? I don't think it's necessary. You know, it's costly. Uh, so doing that, okay, I'll just tell you two more quickly. I have a lot of companies, but just the idea is to give you a variety of the things that you can be doing and be thinking about. Because it's not just the internet thing that you're using every day. Um, there's a problem that you're not thinking about at all which is end of life, the last 12 months. So anyone my age, their parents are going through it. You may have grandparents going through it right now. And the last 12 months, uh, there are about 25 things that you will need to buy that you haven't thought about yet and don't know how to buy. What's your favorite wheelchair uh, rental vendor? You know, probably not, probably not. Uh, you have to figure out wills and probate court. Probate court is different state by state. So you gotta figure that out ahead of time. You may need to buy some things for my mother. We need to get something that is near the bathtub because we don't want her to fall and she's getting a little unstable. So there's a whole bunch of stuff there. I gotta figure out how to, how to do that. Um, there's eventually at some point for everyone, there's a funeral, there's a funeral home, there's speeches at the funeral home. There are all kinds of things that you have to figure out and haven't dealt with before. The information online is terrible. It's totally opaque. So right now, if I said to you, can you get me a hotel room in uh, Ouagadougou for Saturday night, you'd be like, yeah, give me three minutes and I'll have you four choices. If I said to you, uh, why don't you go find me a burial plot in New York City? There's only 25 cemeteries. Can't be that hard, right? Can't be done. Not online, can't be done. Can you price comparison shop funeral homes and caskets? Nope, can't do that. You intentionally want to take advantage of the fact that you're feeling terrible. You go in there, they tell you it's $5,000 for a coffin. And you're like, ah, it seems like so much. And like, it's your father. <laughs> you're like, uh, okay when that's not how you should make If you want to spend that, that's fine, but maybe there are other choices that are, that are better for you. So uh, that's another one. And the, uh, another one, B2B, is this is a company I didn't actually found. I'm the lead angel investor in, which I occasionally, occasionally do. Uh, and so the, solving the problem that when you have a product that you want to make that is uh, made of plastic, injection molding, so half the things right here, all the stuff is, uh, is plastic, this is, this is injection molding, um, everything there. So uh, you make it often in China right now, probably 50% in China. There are a thousand factories in China that do that. Which one are you gonna choose and, and why? And also, if you even talk to people that do this for a living, they're like, oh, I visited three. And that'd be the equivalent if I told you, my daughter's, my daughter's applying to college and uh, you know, she met someone who went to Montana State, so she's thinking of going there. And you're like, that's not how you choose a college. You, there's a data, information, figure what you want. And so that doesn't exist today. And so we will have vetted 250 factories, put 100 on the platform. Uh, out of those 100, when you give us your drawings or you, you put your drawings in, we'll route it to the right 25, 
in the same way that you'd route it to the right 25 colleges if you knew the candidate. And then we'll get 20 bids back. And then you can decide to go visit them, not visit them, choose. But you'll, you'll, we will save you six months of work, free to you. Every factory will give us 3% of the order if they get the order. So it's on contingency. So uh, that launches in about four weeks. Um, so look, there, there are opportunities everywhere. This is changing every aspect of society. And so you are in the right place right now. And so things to think about as you go career-wise is that one, uh, don't make, think of how you chose a college. I, I'm appalled, actually appalled, at how people in all colleges, including Yale, choose what they do after Yale. And here's why. If I, my, my daughter, who probably is going through what you went through, has uh, visited, I don't know, 15 colleges, so that's probably 15 days, and then spent, I don't know, many hours studying for SATs and stuff like that, and then another 40 hours filling out the application. So there's probably 200, 300, 400 hours of work going in to figure out something that actually is not that important. So if, what I mean by that is, if you had not gone to Yale, you weren't gonna just like go straight to prison. You were gonna go to some other very, very good school, maybe not quite as good, but really good, and frankly, you know, people at B schools, Harvard, things like that, they do fine, they do fine, <laughs> you know. You can still, you can still make it. Um, no, the point is there are a lot of good schools and you know, and, and you would do just as well. Now, the decision you're about to make, about to make when you graduate, is actually more important. It's more important because you, what a lot of people do is just, oh, I don't know, Bank of America's coming on campus, so maybe I'll go there. And then they made me an offer, and I'm like, oh, okay, it seems good. So that's just like if I told you my daughter's only gonna apply to people who send you know, pamphlets to the house. Uh, that's terrible. And you will find out of your 10 friends, 20 years from now, at your reunion, that maybe half are still in the same industry that they went into day one, even though they didn't choose it consciously. They just got an offer. And so you, and it, and you run a risk of going down the wrong path. What I mean by that, you could get uh, an offer from Time Magazine. So let me just make fun of Time Magazine for a second. Uh, Time Magazine is, uh, you know, could be a career uh, ending thing for you. And so first of all, go look at Time Magazine 10 years ago and look at it today and see if you can even tell them apart. You can't because nothing's happened. So it's not even interesting. But I'll give you an example. I just uh, interviewed someone who went to a great Ivy League school who was at a publication like Time Magazine. And uh, she's been working there for actually about eight, 10 years. And, and she wants to do something online with me. And I'm not gonna hire her because she doesn't have enough digital experience. She's already stuck. So what's she gonna do? You know. She's, she now has to go back. I said to her, if you're not gonna do this, and because I'm not gonna make the offer, you need to get into digital very quickly or your, your career is just gonna stall. Time is out of business. And I don't know who's gonna hire you at that point. That's someone who's 32. I mean, there are people who go down a path, uh, example I sometimes have given before is uh, the Procter & Gamble trap with apologies to everyone here because it's a great company and I'm sure some of you use their products and everything. But uh, out of business school, it's known for great marketing. Great marketing, your father will tell you, great marketing. Um, you should go do that. So you're like, I get this offer, that's cool, I go work there. The problem is you're pretty good at your job. See what happens? Two years later, you get promoted. Now you were manager, now you're senior manager. So you're like, see? It's good. And then, you know, two, two, three years later, you get promoted again. So you're like, see? Now I'm, I'm director. Then you go to one of your reunions, and you see your friends who are working at Amazon and doing a startup and doing this and, and solar energy and and then you wake up one day and you're like, you know what? I don't care about the entire goal of my unit, which by the way, if you work for Pampers, they had 44.1% market share last year. And the goal, and it's a stretch goal, is 44.2% this year, which represents, by the way, like $500 million of extra revenue. So, you know, they should try and do that. But you're like, really? That's what I'm gonna spend the rest of my life? I didn't even consciously choose Pampers as a career. I don't even care about Pampers. And so what am I gonna do now? And then you come interview with people like me and I'm like, it's great, but you know, your classmate's been working at an e-commerce company for seven years, so why would I hire you, who've been doing this huge scale and, from my point of view, learn bad habits that don't even transfer to a small company? And so, and you have now a spouse who uh, has a job in Cincinnati with you, and what are you gonna do? And so, you wanna be thinking about the industry you're going into, 
You want to feel, although you can't predict the future, that these are good skills, these are good things happening. You have a run that you can see yourself there 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Obviously, there's a chance that you'll switch, and people do switch. I have switched in my career. It can happen. But uh, sometimes it doesn't happen as much or uh, as, as you want, and people can get stuck. So these are very, very valuable moments, and you need to use your summers. So my, my son graduated last year and was able to get all the jobs he wanted to work for an internet company in Paris. My wife is French, and so had a French passport. Um, and, but he walked in, having had worked a summer at Warby Parker, having worked a summer at Twitter, and having worked a summer at uh, Zola. And so they're like, wow, that's a ton of internet experience. Um, great. Everyone made an offer because he had fully prepared and spent those summers doing it. If you walk in and say, look, I worked at the summer camp, uh, you know, one summer which was really great, and then I did some random thing here, I did some random thing there, that's just not going to have you compete with the guy next to you, the woman next to you who has relevant experience. So use those summers. Use your time here. You need to be a knowledgeable consumer about what you're going into, what you're doing. The third thing is, Use Yale as much as you can to be as technical as you can. I'm not technical. I'm not a programmer. I took one or two courses in Fortran, which has been super useful, um, <laughs> in 1984, three. Uh, but, and, and not that everyone here needs to be a, a computer science major at all. But this is the time for you to take some CS courses, take some data science courses. Those skills are incredibly important. You will regret not doing that. And it doesn't matter if you are going to get a B and you thought you'd get an A if you took something else. It doesn't matter. This is the time of your life to build those skills. It will only become more important and you'll regret it. And it's very hard to do afterwards. Technically you could, but you probably won't. Um, this is the time to do that. So be as technical as possible, be as well informed as possible, and go down, go down the path which you're going down in this career. It's just more Interesting. If you've always wanted to go into banking, I went into banking, by the way, for four years, and I loved it. But I see a lot of my son's friends who went into banking, wasn't really conscious, they just sort of showed up, and they're only two months in right now. I saw them all, you know, a couple weeks ago, and 50% of them hate their job. And you don't want that. You know, you're, you're coming out of Yale. You should have choices. In some ways, it's your fault if you don't have the right choices. Not that you can just choose, I want this company, I'm going to get that job. But the career you want to go into, the, that you love, that you're excited about, which could be one of 50, many, many great things to do. Go do them, but just make sure it's a true conscious decision. And it helps when you've spent time by listening and thinking. Like right now, you know, during this whole two-day period, you're going to be thinking a little bit about this. And maybe you conclude, yes, love it. But you might come out and think, I really like healthcare, and I want to do healthcare, but do healthcare tech, uh, or something else. Whatever it is, a uh, million choices but make it consciously. So let me do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up, and I'd be happy to talk about topics on any number of subjects. Things, you know, everything obviously startup related, technology related, fundamental trend related, anything Yale related. Uh, I've been on the board for five years uh, on that. Uh, I spent a bunch of time in political policy areas, so everything I do with New York City, state, at various points considered running for office uh, in some things, haven't uh, I don't know if I ever will, but I've thought about that and I spent a lot of time with the Cuomo administration and the de Blasio administration and thinking about especially tech and policy, uh, how do we use technology better as a city and a state. And then I have a bunch of geopolitical interests. I'm on the board of Human Rights Watch. I'm very involved with Mercy Corps. Uh, I was on the board of Doctors Without Borders. So a lot of uh, global health and uh, not that I'm an expert, but I do spend some time there. So happy to talk about anything you want to talk about. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks for giving us mm -hmm. an hour. Um, I'm uh, Victor. I'm a senior in Trumbull. Um, I kind of want to ask the best you college. I just want to say. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so I just kind of want to ask you about your failures, actually. Yeah. Um, so like, for every successful company you start, you know, how many projects do you have to abandon early on, and what does abandoning abandoning a project early on successfully look like yeah. to you? Yeah. So I, I this is an unusual answer. I, I don't. I've had very few companies that ever not worked. Um, but the hit ratio normally would be much lower. I've had many individual failures within those. So, you know, uh, at, at DoubleClick, I bought a company called Abacus uh, for a billion dollars, uh, data company, really great idea, until I sold it three years later for $200 million. So I lost $800 million. Oops. 
Uh, don't do that. Don't do that. Turns out people don't like it. Um, so I launched as part of Guilt, Guilt Taste, beautiful site, uh, food category. Unfortunately, apparently I was the only person who thought it was a really good idea because hardly anyone came to it and we spent $10 million and closed it down, which is not as bad as when I launched Park and Bond, which is a full price men's store on Guilt and uh, that didn't do well enough. So we lost $12 million on that and closed it down. Uh, so along the way, and that's not including hiring people, uh, you know, set up a big office in Scandinavia that we lost $20 million on. So we, we have scale, many things are going to go wrong. Um, so I had, I had a company called Panther Express, which was a competitor to Akabai years ago that ended up selling, but lost a little bit of money. on Everyone lost a little bit of money on that. Um, I have a company right now that I uh, started a year and a half ago called, it was Denverite, which is a, if you think of Business Insider, but it just aimed at the Denver market but not for business, for just news in general, competing with the Denver Post. And so sold it to a company that does the same thing in Philadelphia uh, because I'm not sure, I, I, just not, I don't feel as good about the idea as I did, so I'm a shareholder there. Um, so if you go into the space, you are going to have many things that go wrong. And you have to think of yourself like a professional baseball player. And so if you said, I want to play professional baseball, I just, I just really can never get out. It just stresses me out. And you're like, okay, you can't play baseball because good players are out 60% of the time, 65% of the time. You have a, you know, you have failure all the time. And so as an entrepreneur, you have to think about that. If you wait, the reason entrepreneurs have lots of failures, part of it is you have to move before you know the right answer. Because if you don't, someone else is going to do that. And then I'm going to be six months or a year behind. So if you said, how are you going to know that these Starbucks competitors things are going to work? I obviously don't. And I could do five years of research, and then I'd have a better chance of knowing. And guess what? Someone, you know, the problem is there's too many good entrepreneurs in the world, and there'll be 20 of them out there that are eating my lunch. When I uh, started Gilt, I thought, oh my god, I, I knew this business model because in France there was a company, Vent Privé, that was doing this very successfully. Most people here didn't know that. So I thought, this is a great idea. I'm just going to borrow this idea uh, from France, launch it here. It's going to be awesome. Uh, big head start. So started in May, launched in November. It's hard to launch much faster. By the time I launched, another company had already launched. They were already working on it in their garage somewhere. A week later, someone else launched. Really a lot. It's still around. And a week after that, uh, Hot Look uh, uh, launched. So now my big head start turned out to be no head start. I was one of four competitors at the same time. And that always is going to happen. What matters is execution after that. Just working really quickly. Yeah. A term tacking we often hear in GCS. Can you take that term and translate it to the students as to what they could do from the academics and going out into career? What do you mean ta tacking? So you talk about business, businesses, yeah. startup businesses having to adjust. Oh yeah, career. I think of it as pivoting. But yeah, so yeah, so oh sorry, there there uh, sometimes you have an idea in the beginning and you just hit the idea right and you're doing the same thing eight years later and except that doesn't happen that often. Uh, so sometimes you can have a totally, you have to change your, your business model because you conclude it's not working. Mongo, the original model for Mongo was not a database company, even though it's going to be the first database company in 25 years to go public, so it all sounds great. We were going to do cloud computing infrastructure, which was a very, very good idea in 2007. It's sort of obvious today, but in 2007, there weren't that many companies building cloud computing infrastructure. To do that, you needed to do a whole bunch of things. And we bit off more than we could chew. So about a year in, we concluded that we were building a database. We were doing all these six different things. And we thought, oh my god, we're not going to be able to raise $100 million, which was necessary to do this without any proof points. And we're making great progress in the, uh, in the, in the uh, database area. So we stopped doing 80% of what we were doing and just focused on the database. So that was a, a good example there of really changing. In terms of um, Business Insider, it was less pivoting than, it, you can't start a worldwide business magazine with two employees, right? That just doesn't work. You can't keep people with the Wall Street Journal doing that. You have to narrow down what you're doing. So we only did New York Tech. The name was actually Silicon Alley Insider. And so we did a good job in New York technology and then started to slowly expanding. So it wasn't pivoting, it was just expanding out. And you normally have to do that, start narrow. You know, Guilt started with just one sale of women's clothing per week then two, then three, and then eight months later, men's, and then kids, and a bunch of things that worked, and then some that, that didn't work. Uh, so 
yeah, things you, there's no formula. You're always looking, every quarter, you're literally looking at your business going, is this working? I've learned a lot now, and do I feel good about it, and do I want to continue doing it? Once in a while, I haven't had it, but you could, you could make the right decision and just shut it down and say, it's not working. And actually, I think there's a bigger problem of people continuing too long than people giving up. Entrepreneurs are, by definition, congenitally optimistic, or else they wouldn't be doing crazy stuff like this that are low probability, competing with a whole bunch of existing players, um, unless they're really optimistic. That's good to get them going, and it's bad, because I'll hear people coming in saying, oh, you know, I know we missed our numbers last year, and it's not going as well as I thought, but I've got a bunch of new ideas. It's going to work now. And then a year later, like, yeah, yeah, those didn't work, but wait till next year. I've got some new things. And at a certain point, you're like, your relationship is not working out. You know, you need to break up. And that's a tough decision because you have to admit failure, especially if it's your first one. Now I don't feel, I don't care as much. Enough things have worked. If something doesn't work, I just, I, I shut it. I shut it or I sell it and get out. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned uh, going narrow, starting narrow. I'm curious, do you have any recommendations for new grads in choosing careers, first jobs that are on the narrow side versus broader exposure, for instance, like software engineering or consulting or well, one, you know, it's, there are people that are very, very happy doing consulting, and it's a great skill base. So I'm actually uh, relatively positive on doing that. Um, you have to just figure out whether that's what you want to do. You know, some people like it. Some people don't like it at all. Some people think they're not going to be that great at it. Uh, uh, look, I think if you can go down the technical path, I think it's a, it's a good idea. So, you know, there's such a shortage of people with technical backgrounds that even if you're not planning on, on programming for 25 years, even if you do it for a year or two, we'll give you great skills that, you know, in, you can always go out, you can't go back in. So you can become product managers. You know, everyone, every VC wants to back someone that has a technical background and understanding, but good interpersonal skills. That's like the, the perfect candidate and, dis, and disproportionately do well. Now, by the way, a lot of candidates who are running and starting companies have backgrounds like mine. Liberal arts, you know, are okay in math and things, but don't really know how to program, but have, are close enough that they can do it. At the end of the day, let's not forget that your job as a CEO is to hire and motivate people. That is the job. And even if you're, whether you're technical, marketing, finance, whatever, you're going to have five people in those five categories under you, and your real job is can you attract great people, and can you, will they stay, will they work hard, will they work together? And so I tell people that I thought some of the best training for me in doing what I do today was running uh, student groups in high school and college. So I, I was, ran a lot of student groups. I ran the Liberal Party here. I ran the Yale College Student Investment Group, uh, student council in high school, that sort of thing, I mean, classic stuff that you guys have on your resume from high school. Um, but the, those, those, that's really great training because if this is a, a student group and I'm running it, no one has to be here. Right? The moment you're bored or not feeling good about it, you're just like, oh, I'm too busy, I got a test coming up, and you don't show up. And so it's actually good training for startups where people do not have to show up because they can go across the street and get a job in a second. It's not like other companies where they're locked in forever. Um, so you need to create an environment that is fun for people, and, and you're doing the right thing, and mission-driven. People have to believe that they're doing something that is mission-driven, you're not paying them. So I thought that was great training. Talk a bit about your first company. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned that your career started in banking. And, yeah. Um, what? Uh, when did you uh, sort of decide to make the jump? Yeah. So for me, so I basically four years in investment banking, business school, then uh, two and a half years working for Disney in finance. I was making the transition because there weren't very many startups at the time. Um, then uh, I went can, went and became the COO and CFO of a division of a media company, 180 people. And we uh, had to do a turnaround of that. And then in 1995, I read about the internet and I launched an internet site for that company. It was called the Dilbert website, you know, the Dilbert comic strips. We own Peanuts and Dilbert and things like that. And so business-wise, it seemed like a really good idea because we could go directly to consumers and not have to sell it to a newspaper. So at the end, beginning of 96, I went to the parent company and said, look, this internet thing is going to be huge. And it's hard to remember that most people were not on the internet at that point. Like, half of people probably didn't have an email address, just didn't use it. So I went to them, I told them, and we have a head start, so why don't you give me a couple million dollars and I'll build up an uh, internet division. As a loyal corporate citizen, this is the right thing to do. 
So they, uh, in their brilliance, came back to me two months later, and I was like, okay, two months is a long time, and said, we think the internet could be a fad. It turned out, actually, not really. It's, a, it's going pretty well. Uh, so they kind of missed that one. Uh, and they thought, if you're successful, you'll cannibalize our current business, which, of course, is the thing you learn in business school. That's a stupid point of view, because if you don't cannibalize it, the guy across the street's going to do it, so you might as well do it. Um, so then I said, but this led to the whole decision, I said, okay, I've pitched my idea to you. You've clearly whiffed on it, so I'll go do it myself. And therefore, I do believe this internet thing is going to be big. I think it may be the most fundamental thing that happens in my lifetime, for business-wise, which it has been. And so let me go do that. So I went out to start a DoubleClick and ran across, as part of my research, there were two companies doing something similar in ad, I thought advertising and ad technology was going to be a big part of it. Met the first company, they weren't very impressive. So I was like, great. Uh, met the second one, and I was very impressed with them. They had a great technology tool. And I realized I didn't, they, they created the, the dynamic ad targeting that controls all of the internet today. And I was like, wow, I don't really know how to do that yet. Um, and they said, why don't you come join us? And so I did that instead of starting my own. So a lot of people I thought, thought I founded DoubleClick, but I didn't really. I was just a very, very early employee. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And you also mentioned, uh, you also just mentioned that you know, you know, you have a liberal arts background, and you, uh, you know, and you know, student groups and things are really valuable to you. How do you, how do you square the the, the the tension between that? Because like, someone who is trying, you know, because like you, if you devote yourself to a lot of things in college and and, and, and high school and such. Um, you can get a lot of valuable experiences that aren't like, you know, that are more leadership based or not directly things. But, but then like, if someone, if, you know, potential theoretical hiring manager you says, oh, we don't have direct experience and doesn't hire you, you know, like, how, which one wins out? Like, how do you, how do you, or honestly, how do you on, as the hiring side, you know, manage that tension? Yeah, so, first of all, there's different types of jobs. So there are some type of jobs that you just wouldn't have any experience in, in college, you know, in doing. But that's why I'm really focused on using your summers. Because your summers, you have flexibility, and I think certainly your last two summers, you know, those are big opportunities. If you want to go travel and do something else, that's great, but you're paying a price for that. Um, because you are, you are not, it's not just that you make yourself look better to get a job, is that you figure out whether you like this or not. So, for example, my son had spent, was thinking startups and was thinking government. He loves, he did global affairs here, so he worked uh, in D.C. for a summer, and that was very useful And that he concluded he didn't want to do that. Where is he thought he did want to do that. Then he did a startup. He's like, okay, I do want to do that. So you need a couple bites at the apple because it's hard to know when you're 21 or 20 or 18 or 19 what you like to do. So you just want to see that. And I think some people can use a little bit more time. You don't want to spend your whole time of four years looking for a job. You're, you're at Yale. You should be exploring all kinds of cool, interesting, fun things that you want to do here uh, in business school. But at the same time, it doesn't make sense to spend zero time doing that. Uh, and so uh, when you're hiring people, you know, look, sometimes you're just looking for some with, people with raw brain power, and that can work. Um, but a lot of times you'd like to know that this person wants to do this and is going to like it. And I feel more comfortable if someone has done a slightly similar thing. And I'm like, okay, I just de-risk this a little bit. Uh, then someone who's just like, I have no idea what you do, but I'm here um, and up there. So that's why that's I, I would do. I still spend most of your time on the core Yale experience and some of it thinking about your next step. And the same is true in, in business schools. Even more should be more focused, or forestry school, or anything else. Yeah. So, what do you think about student entrepreneurs and the innovation um, within student body? Yeah. So, well, a couple things for you. And I'm very involved on many elements of YEI. And I was on the committee to find the, the person who was actually a friend of mine that we found, who Andrew McLaughlin, who's heading up City. Uh, we're trying to really do Yale. One of our areas of focus is to encourage our entrepreneurs more and more. Uh, Ten days ago, I hosted 80 people in New York City, 80 Yaleys, uh, ranging from people who graduated a year ago who have just started a company, to talk about, to meet Andrew, to meet Ben Pollock, the provost, and to talk about how we're going to support entrepreneurs in New York City and other places. So we're trying to do a lot more of that. And Yale can do more, and they are starting to do more, which is good. So in terms of entrepreneurs here, look, I think it's... Uh, I don't discourage people from doing a startup at this age, but you need to know that most of them don't work. There is a sweet spot of successful startups in the internet space, 
and it's sort of 26 to 40. Now, could be younger, could be older, but actually if you go through the top 100 companies, relatively few are outside of that band in consumer companies. In, in enterprise software, it's a little bit older. There's, I think there's a lot of benefit to you joining a existing startup. It could be a 25 person company, could be a 100, 200, that's growing really quickly so that you can learn a little bit more about management, uh, you can see things in action, you learn a area because you're gonna be in marketing or product or program or something. There's a big learning curve there that is very, very helpful. Having said that, there are some, I'm involved with some successful uh, Yale startups. Spring, um, Spring.care is a company that started a year and a half ago, won the Harvard Yale uh, startup competition, and I'm the, the lead angel investor in that. Uses artificial intelligence to help doctors prescribe antidepressants. Um, very cool idea and getting a lot of traction. They're going to raise around soon. Um, so you can, you can have some great ideas uh, that, that can work, and it can be a great experience, whether it works or not. Most people, I was talking to someone who just did a startup. In fact, we had probably 20 people in their zero to five years out of Yale at my house, and some of them didn't work, but they still felt like their experience, they learned more during those two years than they could have done using, doing anything else. So you have to feel passionate about the idea, and that can either happen or not happen. You know, not everyone has an idea ready at that moment, and if you don't have it, then go do something else. If you do have it and you just can't let it go, then you need to assemble a team and do it. The reason 21-year-olds have trouble having successful startups is that they have trouble hiring senior enough talent to work for them. And that can get away. If you can do it with all 21-year-olds, that's okay, but then when you start saying, I'm gonna go, like I've met with a team that wants to do a new type of loan product, they have to close deals with all the Ivy League institutions, and they're having trouble getting in the door, they're having trouble closing that, uh, that's the hardest part. But it can be done. Look. You know, Bill Gates did it. Mark Zuckerberg did it. Yep. Um, so you mentioned the internet was uh, very hot uh, when you were just uh, moving into the finance industry. Yeah. Um, so recent years, we've seen like cloud, we've seen mobile, we've seen shared and digital economy. What comes to that? Yeah, some of those. So the, what most people say right now that you know we are in the very, very early stages of AI, and so that's going to reverberate. You know, everything everything. But still, it's just a subset of using technology. So I don't worry about the fundamental trends, and you don't have to pick a trend because you have to pick a company. Um, but all those areas are forward-looking. You know, autonomous vehicles, drones, big category. Um, but, but even within these sectors, sometimes it's not a breakthrough, you know, technology. It's just using, like Nomad's not breakthrough technology, but is going to be a very successful company in using technology in a better way. So that's a perfectly good thing to, to do there. Um, yeah, but the, the, the good news is, look, we're seeing impact everywhere. Yeah. So um, I'm at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. I'm interested in technology for development. And I was wondering, like, how do NGOs or different development agencies, Human Rights Watch or Mercy Corps, attract the kind of ideas and talent in, in technology for, from data scientists or whatever to be able to better impact, you know, yeah. have a bigger impact? Yeah, and I work with both of them on that. And so, one, they're hiring people, uh, and then they're hiring, they're using outside vendors as well in a really cool way. So, uh, I have one more company uh, to talk about System One. System One uses Internet of Things devices to measure uh, the output of medical devices in Africa. So, let me explain. Your USAID, you give $25 million to uh, the government of Mali to get machines that, that test for tuberculosis. Uh, and so you, it buys a thousand machines, they're in a thousand rural hospitals. Then you know what happens? Three months later, a third of them have been sold for parts and aren't even functioning. That's bad for the people who don't get the benefit, it's bad for USAID because that article is a terrible article when it comes out and it supports the idea that it's all corruption and terrible. And so these guys put a little device in each machine, then the results come back so you can see in every single hospital how many positive, how many negatives from yesterday's tests. What's the output? The output is that one, it discourages you from selling it for parts because we'll know within a day. Two, that we can actually see outbreaks. You assume that people see outbreaks. Governor Mali doesn't even know when there's an outbreak of tuberculosis somewhere. It could be months before they find out. And meanwhile, thousands and thousands of people are infected. Third is that there's a problem that you definitely wouldn't think of, the vial problem. You need these vials that they are part of the test. So you have to supply them to the hospitals. They expire. 
over, I don't know, a month or two months. Or something. So simultaneously, what these organizations know is that half our hospitals have run out, and so they're doing no tests. These half have too many, and they're expiring, and there's no connection. So you'd say, well, pretty obvious connection, but you need the data. And so one of the things we'll be able to do now, they think they lost $20 million maybe of expired vials, wasted. That's just one, and that's one type of test, one area. The number could be $100 million overall. I don't know how big it is. And so now we can connect those and so say, look, we need 50 vials to go over here to these guys, and which saves money and saves people's lives and things like that. So those are good examples of, I, I mean, I didn't think of this, I'm an investor, but I'm like, oh my God, that is a, a mission-driven, great business doing $4 million in revenue after two years. So great stuff happening out there. And so there are ways for everyone, like you with your background, to really help make the world a better place uh, and do that in uh, regardless of what you're doing. All right, well, I, we have to break in one second. Last question. Mm -hmm. So you've been involved in the uh, Yale Political Union and you've considered running for office. Yeah. What are some ways in which your experience with entrepreneurship uh, have affected your politics? You know, I don't... I, well, they've, a little bit. I don't think that's the driving force, uh, but it does. Uh, I think it, it one, it, you use technology better. So I could give you some appalling stories about how New York City both has used technology well in the police department. And then, you know, I still can't pay my parking ticket with my phone. And that is just a terrible thing. It's terrible for me, but it's also more terrible for New York City because you get a paper parking ticket and then you uh, lose it. So they don't get the money for two months, and then they have to spend $5 to send you a reminder, which you may or may not get, and then they get the money three months later, maybe. And so that, multiplied by millions, could be solved right there. There's all kinds of examples like that. So using technology effectively there, use, running organizations much faster. But a lot of it, I think, in politics is, is not linked to that. It's a more broad set of skills. If you're gonna be mayor or controller, it's the core skills of hiring great people and making good decisions and execution. I mean, the positions I'm interested in are ones that are really executive positions, not legislative positions. Uh, and so be, be, be CEO. So hopefully I'd pitch that I'm a better CEO. Most of the people that we elect, Bill de Blasio, had managed 40 people in his life ever. And then the next day was managing 300,000. So if that were a company, no one would ever hire that person. Not that he's done a terrible job, but you know, that's a big leap. And so we could use people that have, I think, had more managerial experience in those positions. Voters don't distinguish between senator and, and governor. They think they're kind of, one person can do both if they're interested in politics, but they're totally different. One is a 50-person staff, and one is you know, 10,000 or 50,000 people. So, all right, I need to wrap things up, but thank you all for being here, and I'm glad you're doing what you're doing and excited that you're uh, interested in this field. Thanks.